let's talk about bonding. Now, bonding in chemistry is kind of deceptive. I've seen people think about bonding as if two hydrogen atoms are bound together using a big chain-like thing that just keeps them from drifting apart, and that's what chemical bonding is to them. But it's really not. Chemical bonding in chemistry is more like magnets. So if we have two magnets, it's obvious what happens. They attract each other because we have our positive end, our northern pole and the southern pole, and those create magnetic attraction. And that's what makes these two objects attract to each other. And that's exactly what chemical bonding is. Because chemical bonding is a force of attraction. Force of attraction. Now there are three main types of bonding that you cover in the A-level specification. You cover ionic, you cover metallic, and you cover covalent. And these are the three things I'm going to be looking at today. And we'll start with ionic bonds. So an ionic bond, as the name suggests, it involves ions. As an example, let's use sodium chloride, NaCl. If we look at the individual atoms, we can, either ha we can have our sodium atom and our chlorine atom. Now, looking on the periodic table, let me just draw a quick thing to illustrate my point. On the periodic table, sodium is about here in group 1. It's group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. It's in group 1, which means that it has its highest ele energy electron in group 1. So we can represent that, its highest level energy electron, as a little dot here. One electron. Chlorine, however, is in group 7, round about here. So it has 7 electrons in its highest energy level. And for these two things to bond together, like in sodium chloride, they're going to need a positive thing attracted to a negative thing. That's what there needs to be for a bond to happen. So in order for that to happen, we have to make these two things ions. So in order to make these ions, we can either make this positive or we can make it negative. Same with chlorine, we can make it positive or negative by moving these electrons around. So one possibility is for us to make sodium negative. And we do that by giving it electrons from chlorine. So all of the chlorines from all of the electrons from chlorine would go into our sodium atom. And that needs to happen for one of them to gain a full energy a full energy level and be stable, like the noble gases. So let's look at what that would entail. Well, we'd have to have Na with a little dot plus an electron from chlorine to give Na minus, and that would have two dots. But then we'd need to add another one because we need to get rid of these seven. So Na minus plus E minus to Na two minus. Now this is a problem because we're adding a negative thing to another negative thing. This takes a lot of energy because you need to get past that repulsion that's going to be happening. And then it gets even worse when we go on to Na2 plus and add another electron to get Na3 plus, Na3 minus, sorry. This is going to take even more energy than it did this time. So really that's not a very good solution. A far better solution would not be to make chlorine give its electrons to sodium, but to make sodium give its electron to chlorine. So if we do it this way around, then all we're doing is transferring one electron to something that's not negative. So if we do that, we end up with a positive sodium ion, because we have given a negative electron, and we end up with a negative chlorine ion, because we've given it a negative electron. 
and then this is where our force of attraction can happen. But in sodium chloride, we're never going to get just single ones of these molecules happening. It's a bit of a misconception around how we write the formula. In reality, we're going to have a lot of these things, not just single molecules. So the way we represent that is with some cubic structures. We have our positive sodium atom. Actually, no, I should draw it in the colours I've been working in. That would be a lot be a lot more easy to represent. We have our positive sodium ions, and then we have our negative chlorine atoms. We have a force of attraction between them, but then we also have the force of attraction to another chlorine ion, and another force of attraction to another positive sodium ion. But this is a two-dimensional structure. The real sodium chloride, as you know, is 3D, so it goes down as well. So they end up being attached to more ions, like so. And this is the basic repeating unit for our structure. And this is called a giant ionic lattice. Let's write that down. So giant ionic lattice. This is because this structure repeats several hundred million times in every direction and is the exact same thing all the way through. It needs to be for the structure to stay together. And that's why ionic compounds are often brittle. If you shatter them you'll end up shifting some ions so that they repel and the whole structure will fall apart. So a more accurate way to represent NaCl would be something like Na67,825 Cl67,829 for a really really small section of NaCl. But you just cancel these down to give NaCl. And that is a summary of ionic bonds. Now the other type of bond that we cover are called metallic bonds. Let's do a very fitting silver here, so metallic bonds. Now metallic bonds, as the name again suggests, are all between metals. So from GCSE you probably learnt that metals were these atoms that kind of look like this, that can slide over each other and that's why you can bend them. And that's kind of true, that is what happens. But talking about it at an A-level level, then you need to realise that what's happening is these metal atoms, their energy levels are overlapping and the electrons become delocalised. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the electron configuration of magnesium. Magnesium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. And what essentially happens is when this comes in contact with other magnesium atoms, it shares its two electrons with the other magnesium atoms and becomes Mg2+, with an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and that's it. It's effectively been ionised. So, at looking at this diagram again, all of these atoms are actually positive ions. But wouldn't that mean that all of these ions would repel each other, and the whole structure would fall apart? Well, no, because these overlapping energy levels actually create a, sh a sea of electrons. Think about it like this. If we have our atoms here, they have all shared two electrons. Because they've shared these electrons with these other atoms, 
these electrons are no longer assignable to one particular atom. They can move around to be in the energy levels of all these other atoms. And that's why they're called delocalized electrons. And this creates a field of negative charge because of all these electrons. And these positive ions, these metals, are attracted to this negative sea of electrons. And that is what metallic bonding is. So that's a summary of metallic bonds. Let's go on to covalent bonds. So let's do this one in green. Covalent bonds. Now, a covalent bond is the sharing of a pair of electrons. God, my writing is atrocious. Okay, showing the pair of electrons. I'm pretty sure there's no E here either, but anyway. So, at GCSE, you probably did dot cross diagrams. So with the case of, let's say, hydrogen, you had a ring around here, and then the ring around the hydrogen, simulating their electrons, and one of them would have a dot, and one of them would have a cross, and that would be the bond. And this concept holds up. You have your negative electrons here, creating almost a negative area, and then your positive nucleus, your nuclei here, attracted to that negative area. And that's why these atoms stay together. But looking at it from an A-level perspective, you now know about energy levels, you know about electron configurations. So. If we look at the electron configuration of hydrogen, we see it's at the very top of the periodic table, it has an electron configuration of 1s1. It only has one electron in its s orbital. So if two hydrogen electrons, each with one electron in their s orbital, come into contact, they will share the electron, and both hydrogen atoms, here and here, now have an electron configuration of 1s2. So, really, looking at more complicated examples, let's try and look at carbon to visualise what's going on. Carbon has its orbitals primarily located in the p orbitals. So, let's try and find a colour here for carbon. Let's just do red. So with carbon, it has some p orbitals that are shaped like this, and it has four of them, which is why it can do four bonds. This is a three-dimensional drawing, so it's not the best. So when two carbon atoms come into contact, these energy levels overlap. So we end up with something that looks like it's going into the background, something that looks like this. And it's this overlapping orbital which causes the bond. So we have our electrons in here, the sharing of the electrons that causes the positive nuclei here to attract towards these. So if it's only these orbitals that are involved in the bonding, we can safely say that it's only the highest level of occupied orbitals that are involved in bonding. So if you look at iodine, I2, iodine has the electron configuration that's rather lengthy. It has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, 4s2, 4p6, 4 d10, 5s2, 5p5. So that's a bit of a mouthful. But the highest occupied energy level is actually this level 5. And the p orbital isn't full. The p orbital can, the p orbital can hold 6 electrons, and it only has 5. So it has room for one more electron. 
which is why when two iodines come together, they share an electron to each donate one electron to each other, so they end up with a full energy level in their five energy level. So when we take this concept of covalent bonding and apply it like we did with ion, ionic bonding to a giant structure, we end up with something really cool. Now most people know about diamonds. Diamonds are super hard and they kind of look like this and they use them to cut and there's that myth that there's nothing that can cut diamonds even though there is. So why is this so strong? What is what is it about diamonds that make it really really strong? Well diamonds are just carbon. As we saw before carbon can form four bonds. But what happens if all four of those bonds are bonded to other carbons? Well we end up with a shape like this. Which is also the shape of those orbitals that I showed you earlier. Once again proving the theory that they are these orbitals. So one unit of a diamond looks like this. This is tetrahedral shape that's kind of regular. All these bonds are like the same angles. So what happens if we make more of these? Well, we're going to end up with our original. And then each of these carbons is going to be bonded with this unit. So this becomes this atom. Like so. And then so will this one. And so will this one. And then so will this one. And so on. It will keep on repeating this unit, making more and more of these bonds. And because a covalent bond is so strong, and you're creating an entire compound, all of this compound is covalently bonded together, you're going to need a lot of energy to break it. And that really concludes bonding. I hope that cleared a few things up, and uh, next time I suppose I will talk about the types of intermolecular bonding. So not the bonding within molecules, but bonding between molecules. See you then.